Tonight, we are going to explore certainty. Um, we live in a world which will tell you that in religion, there was very little certainty. But I disagree immensely. In fact, in faith, there must be some level of certainty. In life, we know there are some things that we expect that are certain to some degree. Uh, you expect when you wake up, if there is a tomorrow, not to get too grim on you here, that the sun will rise. And it'll be a very beautiful sunrise. You expect things to happen. One of those things is the fact that life is pretty weird. It is certain that life is weird for people, isn't it? There are tragedies that take place, but in the midst of that, really weird things can take place. And I love those stories immensely. As you may know, London Bridge, there was recently an attack. That's not the funny part of this at all. That's horrible. Uh, and because in the nature of England, they don't have a lot of gun shootings like we might. They have things that I think are a little more terrifying, which is knife stabbings. That's terrifying to me. They had a whole period one time where people were taking uh, bits of acid and throwing on people. That is horrifying to me. But in the midst of those things, humans can rise up, and they can, they can be quite heroic. And I think this is the beautiful part of this. And while this person was going on London Bridge and was stabbing people terrible, there were people that did not back down. They stood up to protect the people around them. And one guy got in with his fists, which makes sense. What a bold and human uh, move that is to go in as like, I'll stop with whatever I can. Another person grabbed a fire extinguisher and chased him down with a fire extinguisher. Use what you got, right? One man who was a chef, I believe, was thinking where he was at a restaurant, used what he got. He grabbed a narwhal's horn, I'm not making this up, off the wall and chased the man down with a narwhal's horn, stabbing at him at some level. It is certain that that's super weird and kind of beautiful, all at the same time. A certain thing for sure. I, we don't have enough of that in Evansville, but there's no narwhals. The other thing that I think is certain is babies. Um, we, have a, we live in a time period where people tend to name their babies bizarre names, exotic names, special names. You can do that. That's fine. There is no correlation between what you name your child and their success in life. That's been um, said as a fact. In fact, the most common name given where there's an attempt to make a person feel special is the name Unique. That is a name that has been given, and there's actually 238 variations of the spelling of the name unique so that people would feel special. But there's an effort also by people to give them names that it's just a bad idea. There's certain celebrities you would never name your child. This is a cute baby. It's a crying baby, for sure. But if you name that baby Adolf, it takes a little bit different tone, doesn't it? Cute baby, right? Look at those chubby cheeks. That is such a cute baby. But if you named her Jezebel Jenkins, this will go down pretty quick. You name a baby Miley, and I don't know if this is a boy or a girl, but either way, Miley's a bad idea. You name this child Gary Busey, bad idea all the way around. You name this child Biff. Isn't that such a Biff? <laughs> That's the preppiest kid I've ever seen. But nothing good has come out of Biff uh, in any movie or any person. Biff. The other side of babies is, if we're being perfectly honest, is not all babies are cute, are they? The noggin on this child is huge. It is a massive baby head, um, and it's drooling. I'm allowed to make fun of this baby. And this baby is always cute, isn't it? <laughs> always cute. It's certain, right? It's certain things. In a more serious note, we can know that there's certainty in the Bible. Certainty in the Bible. And that is a beautiful thing. Certainty in the Bible is something that should give you comfort. Certainty in God is something that should cause you, when that sun does rise in the morning, to know. To know for a fact that today is going to be a good day. You may face any manner of trials. Seriously. But it's a good day because God's there with you. It's a good day because you were created in God's image. It's a good day because God loves you. It is a great day because if you have Jesus, you have freedom, and you have the ability to go out and praise him and live for him. These things are certain. They're not gambles. They're not possibilities. They are certain 
when we grab a hold of God. It is certain from Scripture that God loves mankind. The Godhead did not have to create us, and yet He did. He's perfectly, perfectly in union between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And yet he said, let us make man in our image and chose to love his creation and give him opportunity. He created the entire universe in such a particular way that we are able to benefit from it and enjoy it and appreciate it. He didn't have to create it that way, but he did. And it is certain that we can enjoy that creation. It's also certain that in his wisdom, he provides for us in his creation, and it is certain that our needs can be taken care of from the most simple way possible. Uh, We can have shelter, and we can have food and clothing and the things that we need. From the most primitive tribes to the most civilized uh, groupings of people there are, God provides for people. And it's beautiful, and it's certain. He also protects us, doesn't he? He protects us. You may have temptations come at you, You've got a Bible to turn to. You've got a God to go to. He protects you from that. We know that there's a devil that runs around, but we also know that he is in no way greater than God. That is certain. And because of that, we can move forward. We weren't created to cower in fear within the the walls of our church building, even though we know there's evil out there. But we were created because we have a certain God to move out into the world and say, no, Satan, you will not be victorious. No, we will not allow darkness to overcome our lives. This is certain. And we know that he sustains. Ultimately, he will sustain us for eternity in heaven. This is certain. He has promised it to the faithful. And we should take great comfort in that. These things are not possible. These are not maybes. These are certainties. And he's repeated this in the Bible over and over and over and over again. These are big concepts, foundational things that we have in our existence as Christians. And we should enjoy those, know them, and live in them. Certainty. But there's other things that happen that are certain as well for people. Um, People can go through life and there's things that they're going to encounter. Sometimes you may have that moment in which you find yourself, I need some time by myself. I need to go out and contemplate some things in life because life's a little bit difficult. It is certain that all of us as people will struggle in this life. It's certain. You may be the most experienced Christian in the world, or you may be a very novice Christian. You will struggle in some way. And sometimes we get confused in that because we have the idea that if we are a really good Christian, we are really, really faithful, then shouldn't we go through the minefields of temptation, blocking off the temptations and and the darkness and things that happen, and shouldn't we move through this gracefully and elegantly through life? We hope so. But when we look in our Bibles, did that happen with Paul? No. No. The man was beaten, given stripes, locked in prison, didn't happen. Did that happen with Jesus Christ himself? Absolutely not. It didn't happen with so many different Christians, so why would we think that would happen with us? We will have struggles. What is certain is that God gave us a way to manage those struggles. It is certain that our God loves us so much that he's provided us many narratives and examples to say, listen, it could get really bad. But I am here, and my will will be fulfilled. But I am here. Consider Jeremiah. Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah is sometimes called the weeping prophet. And he's back in the Old Testament, and he's one of those long books. I think there's 52 chapters in the book of Jeremiah. But Jeremiah faced some struggles, incredible struggles. This was a time in which uh, Israel, was a, they were going to be called out by God, and Jeremiah was chosen to take on that responsibility because they had um, broken their covenant with God. They didn't keep it. They were worshiping other gods openly. Uh, inside the temple, there would be sacrifices made for God, and outside the temple, there would be sacrifices made to other gods. They had oppressed the poor, they had forgotten the needy, and God says, this is not okay. Jeremiah, you are the one that's going to go tell them this. Okay, God, okay. It wouldn't be easy. 
It wouldn't be easy because they largely ignored Jeremiah. Can you imagine that? You are carrying the very words of God to people who need to hear it, and they are in such a dark, dark place. Could be a little scary, but God's with you. So he carries that message to them, yet they ignore him. They mock him. They reject it. Reject it. In fact, the Bible says they became stiff-necked. In Jeremiah 7, 27, God says, they're not going to obey you. You shall call to them, but they will not answer you. Jeremiah 13, 10, it says, this evil people who refuse to hear my words, who follow the dictates of their hearts and walk after other gods to serve them and worship them, shall be just like this sash, which is profitable for nothing. Jeremiah 17, 23 says, they did not obey nor incline their ear, but made their neck stiff. They were so stubborn, they rejected God's message that they may not hear nor receive instruction. Constantly rejecting God's message. And he's telling them, listen, if you don't pay attention, do you not understand there'll be consequences? God's going to raise up another nation, the Babylonians, and they're going to come in and they're going to siege on Jerusalem and they're going to take you over. You will be enslaved. I'm trying to bring this message to you. And they say, no, we won't have it. And it's not just that they ignored him, but they beat him and they mocked him and they imprisoned him. And the own, his priests, the priests were calling for his death in the midst of this. And at one point they even capture him and lower him down. And some uh, translations will say dungeon, some will say a cistern, but they lower him down into a deep, deep well where he is isolated and left to starve and he is covered by the muck and the mire. But this is a man of God trying to bring this message to the people and they reject him and beat him and leave him for dead. A struggle. And in the midst of it, the book of Jeremiah is a message of hope. And this is the thing we have to remember in the midst of our struggles. There's a hope because in it, there's these chapters that unfold in it in which God does give this condemnation uh, for sure. But in chapters 30 through 33, there is a hope for Israel. A Messiah is coming. And you've read there before where he actually says that a new covenant is coming. And it's going to be greater than the old covenant. Have hope, Israel. In fact, in this new covenant, God will remember your sins no more. His law will be written on your heart. There's a greater thing that's coming. And in fact, in chapter 52, he closes out the book with a message of hope. It's a hope for the lineage of David. It is pointing to a future where God will fulfill his promises that he's made all throughout the history of Israel that will happen. And when we understand that, we can see that the book of Jeremiah, in the midst of all these struggles, something we can relate to, maybe not that extreme, but evil will not be victorious if our hope is in God. And that if we keep pressing on for God's glory, no matter how we are opposed, no matter what we go through, there will be hope. And we will continue a message of hope. That's an important thing to hear because it is certain that right now someone in this room is going through a struggle of some sort. That's certain. You may be thinking, is he talking to me right now? Maybe. I'm not talking to anyone specifically, but it's true that all of us are going to go through it in the next week or the next year or the next two years. It is a fact of life. The way we handle that struggle, this is what God's people have to do. The way we express our devotion to God and live through hope for God in the midst of that, this is what matters. We may be ignored, we may be mistreated, we may face things that are beyond our control, but nothing we face is beyond God's control. And our hope can never sway away from God, and the way that we live can never turn from His expectations. Turn with me over to 1 Peter chapter 4. In 1 Peter chapter 4, in verse 12, Peter says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake in Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. 
For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. When you suffer, it's a temptation to jump on the woe is me situation. Jeremiah could have done it, Paul could have done it, Peter could have done it, any Christian could do it. But when our attention goes to God first, and we see to navigate it in the way that God's people would do it, it is certain that a path will unfold that will glorify God, which should be our main priority. And when we reach out for other Christians to help us, oh man, the opportunities that come out of that. God did not create Christians to walk this path alone or face their struggles alone. Lean on each other. Lean on each other. Next thing that's certain, life is wonderful. It has these great moments in it. But there's times in which we shift to another kind of certainty. And this one's a tough one to deal with, a different kind of struggle. As you grow up and you put your trust in a lot of people, um, you may remember back to your elementary school teachers at some point. I remember Miss Skidmore. Uh, she was this great lady, and she was quite a bit older, and so she had sort of a grandmotherly feel to her. And I found that pretty easy to um, buy into didn't really know a lot of people other than family until I went to school. So initially I was like, hmm, who are you people? And why should I listen to you? Miss Pence, my second grade teacher, she will remind you I had a real issue with that. <laughs> uh, respect for authority, nope and nope. But still, thank you, Miss Pence. Miss Skidmore was amazing. And I found that easy to go into her. But there's a certain point when you grow up, you start realizing, oh man, there's moments where adults will disappoint us. Oh, that's tricky. And then as you get a little bit older, there's moments where uh, my best friend has disappointed me in some way. My boss has disappointed me. And to be fair, I have disappointed somebody else. It is certain that people will disappoint us at some point. That's not fun to hear. That's not fun to talk about. It's not fun to go through. You probably remember something that has happened in that regard to you. While it is certain, God's also helped us figure out ways to get through this. In the Bible, were there moments in which there was incredible disappointment? Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. When you think back to the Garden of Gethsemane and you think about Jesus praying and he's going to the cross because he's dying for our sins. And yet he still loved us and was willing to do that. It's amazing. But every time we sinned, was that, did that disappoint God that much more? even when he was on the cusp of what he was about to do. And, and there his, his apostles are sleeping, and then he goes out, and there comes this military uh, group coming towards him, and there's the servants of the high priest coming towards him, and you know what they're going to do. But it's Judas, who's been with him for three, three and a half years, approaches him with that kiss, that betrayal. And we know Ju Jesus knew that that was going to happen. He'd known for a long time, he's, he's Jesus. There must have been some disappointment. But think about the other apostles and their disappointment. It dawned on me the other day, what was that like for them to see Judas come up and he's the one that had been there with them and man, we're in this together and you're betraying our Lord, our teacher? You're betraying the guy that we're following? It's you, Judas? You were one of us. What was that like? I don't know. And we know that there was a lot going on emotionally in this particular story because uh, John reveals that it was Peter that drew out a sword and he cut off Malchus's ear in the midst of this. And Jesus was like, no, Peter, that's not what we're about. And I'm wondering, why did he go after Malchus? Human thought, wouldn't he gone after Judas? You betrayer, you traitor, you've disappointed us so much you've let us down. And that's not the only case of that. 
Can you imagine the disappointment that Paul felt in Galatians chapter 2 where he recounts it? Paul had devoted so much of his ministry to going out and converting the Gentiles. And when that door opened up in terms of evangelism, man, they were grabbing hold of that, especially him and Barnabas in Antioch. And they were converting and converting and converting, and the church was growing and thriving in Acts chapter 11. But in Galatians chapter 2, Peter comes This must have been disappointing. He says in chapter 2, verse 11, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came with James, before they came with James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Can you imagine the disappointment? Peter, Barnabas, do you not see what we've been doing? These are Christians. Yeah, they're Gentiles, but they're Christians. And now you're acting like Judaism is somehow superior to that, and you have to separate yourself from it? Are you trying to work against what God intended? Are you trying to crush the efforts that we're making here? There must have been incredible disappointment in the midst of that. And so Paul doesn't just let it go passively. He says in the next verse, "...when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel..." When I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, this isn't personal, this is about the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. He engaged the disappointment. He engaged it from a Christian standpoint, a biblical standpoint. We will face disappointment at some point, and we have all manner of choices in how we deal with that. We can rage against them. We can gossip about them. We can try to stir people up to turn against them. We can sit there silently just stewing over it and let that sort of negativity build up within us and go, oh, one day they'll get theirs. Those are options. But they're not Christian options. They're not Christian options. Christian options are exactly what Jesus taught. Love one another even in the disappointment. Forgive one another, even in the disappointment. Reach out, and even in the disappointment, lift someone up. Lift them up. Paul was pretty strong about this. Paul was really strong about this. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24, let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. That's true even in the disappointment. If I love you as a brother because we're Christians and you disappoint me, I need to talk to you. And I need to talk to you in a way that's not to beat you down, not to crush you, not to destroy. But I need to go into it willing to forgive. I need to be the person that comes and tries to establish peace, even in the disappointment. This is the Christian way. Jesus had the right. Of course he did. When Judas betrayed him, think of all the things he could have done in that betrayal. Judas, you have betrayed the Son of God. You're dead. And Judas would have dropped just like that. Judas had his own punishment that was coming. Paul could have thrown a fit and flipped tables and thrown stones and said horrible things about Peter. But he didn't because they're brothers, brothers through Christ. And as a church, in the midst of our family, because this is what happens in families, there's moments where there's disappointment. We have to come together and love each other, forgive each other, and stick together for the Lord as Christians, even in the midst of the disappointment. Ultimately, this is what Jesus did. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. My goodness, could there be no greater disappointment? 
than when we reject our God. And yet he still loves us and is faithful to forgive us. It is a powerful, powerful lesson. And it is certainly true. Sometimes we, in the midst of all these things, we have other things that happen to us. You see this a lot on the internet, so a laptop's an appropriate picture for this, for sure. But people will react poorly to stressful situations. It happens. It really, truly happens. You think about all the stressful situations that were going on in the Bible, and you can see that there were a lot of things that generated out of those. It reminds me, when I was in high school, I went to a summer program, and we did this uh, experiment. I cannot believe we were allowed to do this, but it was a glorious summer where we had a lot of study and we could do these kind of experiments. And the experiment focused on the fact that when people, large groups of people, get in stressful, highly stressful situations, the things that they think they see, the things they think they hear, goes completely out the window. Weird things start coming up. And so because of that, you have to be careful to hear those reports, even though the people were there. Okay, that happened with JFK when he was shot. The reports were all over the place. Certainly happened with 9-11, certainly happens with other things. So in our experiment, uh, what we were allowed to do was to fake a student falling on his fork and he would be scooped up and taken out uh, and that's all people would see. So when the day came, the only people that knew were our class, our teacher, the assistant dean who was going to scoop him up, he was a very large man, um, and the drama teacher who gave us a little blood pack, because what's an experiment with a little blood pack, right? So at lunchtime, the busiest time on campus, we were at a university campus, I'm supposed to be walking along with my tray, bump into the student who happens to trip over the foot of another person and lay on the ground. And he does that, does a great job, just lays there. But then classmate number two stands up and goes, oh no, there's blood. Classmate three starts screaming, four starts screaming, and by that time everyone in the lunchroom is like, ah, ah, it's terrible, it's terrible, it's terrible, panic. And then Joe, the dean, comes in, scoops up the student, and runs out. Again, Joe was really big, so he runs out. Three hours is all it took before this completely went bottoms up bad. There was one group of students who were sure that I pushed him on purpose and tried to hurt him, so there was a group coming to tear me down. I know David Rogers would do that. There was another group that had started this, the rumor that his kidney had been punctured by the fork. Um, he was in a coma, and they gave it an hour later, and he was dead. And people were talking to the counselors. They were upset. They were crying. The truth is Joe had taken him, and they were eating ice cream. That's the truth. They were eating ice cream. But he was dead, and coming all this stuff. And all these people saw. And then what they did was react off emotions. And I think I saw this. And they went to the next person, and they, instead of talking about facts and truth, what they talked about was how they felt first, and, oh, this is so much chaos. And it built more chaos to where, man, it was bad. Lots of apologies and staffs and things were taken care of. Community meetings, it's okay. The girl I was dating at the time smacked me for that. Maybe rightly so. I forgive you, Ann, if you're watching. Um, it was a good moment, all right? That happens. People react poorly. You see it on the internet all the time. You post something, and just read the comments. Negative, 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 negative. Two negatives down, they've changed the whole story. It happens all the time. You flip through your news feed on your phone, and you're going to see half a story off of a headline. You would think every single human was the most evil person in the entire world. Negative, 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 negative. And then we're quick to go talk about it. You know what I heard? These things happen. These things certainly happen. Think about what happened um, in the Bible when large chaotic things took place, right? Can you imagine uh, the rumors that would be spread uh, when 3,000 Christians are baptized and those families that were Jewish at one particular point and devout had become Christians? Rumors, 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 rumors. Can you imagine what happened and did happen when the uh, Christians found out that Paul had become a Christian? Acts 9 tells us. He went to Jerusalem. They didn't want to accept him. That's the guy who killed my friend. That's the guy who locked up my neighbors. That's the guy who turned against us as Christians. All bad reactions. All bad reactions. When we react... We have to do that as Christians. 
And that's tough sometimes because we live in a time and a culture where we want to lead with our emotions first. We want to chase the drama first because it gets a reaction. But that is not the way of Christians. Barnabas showed us that when he said, I will go to that guy. I will go to that guy. And you know what? I will stand with him. And let's talk about this in a truthful way. The reality is that man's a Christian. And the reality is if that man's a Christian, then he's one of us. And he will operate with us. And he will teach with us. And he will work with us. And my goodness, how awesome is it that we see a human do that? Rise above all the chaos and the reacting poorly and grab a hold of truth and react in a way that is Christianly. The temptation's always there. And he could have joined in with the crowd. It would have been very easy to do that. And he had evidence this is the guy who did all those things. But he said, no, the truth is Jesus has washed this man's sins away. The truth is God has a lot of things for him to do. And we're so grateful that he did. Because look at the amazing things that Paul did. Look at the work that Paul and Barnabas did in Antioch that led to all those Gentiles being converted and literally, literally changing the world because someone reacted correctly, correctly. I know those are three things that are pretty negative. You're going to have struggles. Okay, Dave, that's pretty negative. People's going to disappoint you. That's pretty negative as well. And you're going to react poorly at some point. Negative, quit beating us over the head. Okay, fine. Same time, Humans can be pretty incredible, right? Humans can be pretty incredible. In fact, the truth is, it is certain that at points, humans will do truly, truly amazing things. Really amazing things. Sometimes you don't even realize the things that you're doing to help people. You're just being there. I got a book out the other day, and it was given to me before I came here. I'd forgotten about it and pulled it. I was like, what's this? Opened it up, and this one person, he's in college now, and I remember him very well. When he was a little boy, he came up here to lead his prayer for the first time, totally freaked out, started bawling his eyes off, and ran back to the back of the, the, the church. And it was so cute. Um, not because I enjoy children crying so much, but he came back. Uh, I baptized the child. And what he wrote in this book, his great memory, he's like, I'm grateful for the day you spent with me just hanging out in your apartment. I was like, what in the world? I don't remember that day. Not at all. But apparently it meant something to him. So how awesome is that? And he's going to go on and be with other people and do amazing things. It's simple things like that. But beyond that, this last two weeks, I've been amazed at the amount of love and care you've given to our families and our church. We've lost some people that mean so much to us. And those have been opportunities for love to be shared, hugs to be given, words to be said, food to be shared. You've loved each other. That's amazing that that takes place. You have every temptation to ignore one another, you have a world that teaches you to live for yourself, and that's what matters. And yet, despite that, you're Christians who care for one another, who press on for one another. Even Edison Fowler and all the things that he faces and his challenges in Brazil, you pray for him. You welcome him. It's amazing you do that. There are people that you're going to see throughout the holidays that are going to have real needs, and no one's going to know you do it, but you're going to give food, you're going to give clothes, you're going to give care, you're going to listen to someone that's going to miss somebody, you're going to be there. These are amazing things because you're doing them as Christians. And that is a beautiful thing. It is certain you will do this. In the coming year, we're going to have opportunities to do things we may have never experienced before. I'm going to challenge you to be certain in your faith because God is very, very real and God is here with us and the works that we do, it is certain they will glorify Him when we do them as Christians and when we do them at, together. You will have every temptation to give in to reacting poorly. You will have every temptation to be disappointed and rage and throw a fit and gossip and whatever. You will have every temptation that when a struggle comes to totally cave and feel sorry for yourself. Don't do it. You're better than that. God is with you. You're God's people, and that is far more powerful than any of these struggles and disappointments um, and behaviors whatsoever. 
You were created for amazing works. You were created to do tremendous things in this uh, community, and our church is very capable. It is certain this is who we will be. Tonight, I want to leave you with that as a positive sense. Tonight, you may not be a Christian. I've been super thankful for all the Christians we've been uh, having here lately. I'm really grateful for technology and being able to see uh, Mason be baptized. That was amazing. Amazing. Thank you, Denise, for that. Um, we've had some incredible things happening, and we want to keep that rolling for sure. Tonight, you may not be a Christian. You could be. Tonight, you may realize you haven't been faithful, that you've pushed the Lord away. Maybe you've given in to your struggles. Maybe you've given in to the disappointments. Maybe you've let the darker side of life take over, and you're ready to rage against someone. Don't do it. Forgive. Love. Repent. Come back to the Lord, and let us love together and work together. This is Christianity. If there's any way we can help you tonight, come forward as we stand and as we sing.